I just wish the pace of progress didn't move at the pace of the fragility of those who have privileges. Racial progress in America moves at the pace of white fragility. Gender progress in America moves at the pace of male fragility. LGBTQ progress moves at the pace of heterosexuals' fragility. The people in power set the pace and they act as if they have no control. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is Brave New Work, a podcast about reinventing our organizations and the search for a more adaptive and human way of working. I'm Aaron Dignan, and I'm joined by my co-host, Rodney Evans. Hello, everyone. We are also joined today by Xavier Ramey, the CEO of Justice Informed. Xavier, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Aaron, and thanks, Rodney. On uh, today's episode, we're going to talk about your work, about Jedi work, about social responsibility, everything that you're seeing out in the world. But before we get into that, we always check in. We do check in. We will check in. It's how we start the podcast. What's All the my podcasts. check-in question? <laughs> Are you ready for your check-in I'm ready. question? I'm ready. Okay. I knew it was coming. What I love it? it. All right. Well, the check-in question for today that just popped into my brain is this one. What is something that you have splurged on during quarantine that is unusual mm. for you to splurge on? <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, you know what? I got I got the answer. I Go got the for answer. it. I was I, I was thinking about something I splurged on that's useless during COVID, which is boots. Uh, <laughs> who's walking right now? Yeah. Uh, well, people are walking, but it's not for show. Uh, it's all utility struts right now. But uh, something that I splurged on that is very unusual is towels. Mm. Um, I I realize that it is a completely ridiculous thing that I've not replaced my bathroom towels uh, as by by all accounts of my own accounting uh, in roughly 10 years. And as disgusting as that sounds, (laughs) I looked up and I was like, you know, it's time. Like America and justice, it's time. It's time to dry up. I I, got to spend some money on it. <laughs> I got to do some research and learn more about it and invest deeply in the future I deserve. It's I so love nice it. though I to have it. a great towel, I great sheets, great towels. towels. Too. All right, uh, Aaron, what about you? What's your splurge? So- Mine is in the food space. So uh, as as most of us are, I'm eating at home a lot. Lunch every day is made by yours truly. And my wife, Britt, discovered a restaurant supply like supply chain here in Denver where I'm getting the turkey they use at the really nice restaurants when you get a turkey mm. sandwich, which is a totally different thing than what you get at the deli counter. And so it's like, it's thicker, it's juicier, it's amazing. So yeah, my sandwiches taste like restaurant quality dishes. Uh, everything else is crap, but my sandwiches at lunch are on point. Amazing. Is, does, your, does your bread live up to the turkey? Well, I'm using a pretzel roll, so that's yeah. the eye of the beholder. I'll answer that. There it okay. is. For me, it is less of a thing, though I've bought myself okay. a lot of shit since quarantine, and more <laughs> that I am just investing in any service that feels like it will make my life easier right now. Mm-hmm. So, for example, as our listeners know, we adopted a second dog who has had a lot of health issues. And what I've decided is that now that I have two of these maniacs, they're both going to a very expensive sleepaway training for a month mm-hmm. because I do not have the emotional resilience right now to break her spirit and make her behave. And so they both, <laughs> when she is healthy again, both Banjo and Rosie are going to puppy camp for more than it costs to send a human child to camp. And I could not be happier about that money being spent. That I is can't a wait. lovely splurge. Ah, it's gonna be that's going to pay dividends. When they I get really, back. assuming I that so. they, assuming that they think you have the same control as the the boot Well, camp that's the big question, right? They they have their doubts about us, but we're going to give it a go. Oh my gosh! All right, well, that was a good check in. Okay, so today's topic's pretty far reaching. We recently on the podcast talked about Jedi, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and I was recently on a panel with. Xavier, among other folks, and was just so impressed with the work and what's happening out there. I thought, hey, let's, you know, have you come on the show and tell us what is going on out there, because we're doing our own work as best we can inside the ready. And we see little glimpses of this work in our change work around adaptivity and new ways of working and the future of work. But this is a whole different thing entirely. And so I thought we would start by just asking you, What's changed in your work in the last year? This has been such a big year for awakening and for the need to move forward on this stuff. What have you What have you noticed? What's different about justice informed life in 2020 versus 2019? Yeah. Well, the first thing I'll say is it, it's not new stuff. 
This is some old, old work that I, I've gotten myself into. The work of, of moving forward equity in a society and, and uh, microcosmically in its institutions is something that's always happening. The part of the work that's, I think, really important to always contextualize before jumping in is uh, how people come to understand the presence of it and then mm-hmm. separately the urgency of it. So 2020 is a year where I think more people step into understanding the presence of it because mm-hmm. of urgent experiences that motivated them to uh, see it more urgently. Uh, when George Floyd was killed, when the case around Breonna Taylor was was announced several weeks ago, when you see people marching in the streets in all 50 states in active protest against racism, these mm-hmm. sorts of things, when you see the growing vestiges of the Me Too movement, when you see the Americans with Disabilities Act and ADA uh, and all of the, 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 the advances that have happened, primarily coming from the disability rights and justice community being the foundation for a lot of the new advances in the workplace, structural advances in the workplace that have helped people better tackle issues that happened due to COVID-19. It, it's, it's not that the work is new, it's that you just showed up. And I don't mean you you personally, I mean, mm. white folks woke up and many of them are thrashing as they realize they were asleep. Some of them insist on staying asleep and that's why we say you've got to get woke. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but like most people who wake up uh, a little earlier than they would think, they're a little groggy, they resist. <laughs> They're upset. <laughs> They're saying that I just went to sleep. Nothing happened. And it's like 80,000 people are dead. We have a, a, a bigot in office and uh, welcome to the party. You know, it's, it's that sort of a thing. So the first thing I really want to impress upon anyone listening is there is nothing new here. Mm-hmm. There is nothing new here. Uh, people, black people like myself, we have always resisted the cage. Women have always resisted the binds of of patriarchy. LGBTQ folks have always been in active resistance against heteronormativity. There is nothing new here. It may be new to you, but it is not new to people who wanted a better life. Uh, They have always been resisting to get into that very coveted space of society called normal, which is very safe, but it is also an echo chamber. So what's changed this year is people are, are aware that other people exist. And mm-hmm. now they feel a little bit more responsible, but hopefully they, they have the endurance to keep up the fight rather than just see it as like an initiative or something like kind of sure. important, you know? Yeah. And I do, I really want to talk about how institutions do this work and, and where they do it wrong. But just one other question about sort of this moment in 2020, we know that police brutality and murder, particularly of black Americans has been an issue for a long time. What was different about George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, other other incidences this year that that created demonstrations in 50 states? Like like what what do you categorize or what do you notice as being especially sort of coalescing about these moments when when there has been a pattern of this kind of violence over decades? Yeah. For anybody who really wants to jump into like racial theory and and societal development and such, police have always been a problem as it relates to people of color. Always. From the moment that the American police force was created. um, And it was originally the the institution of American policing began as slave patrol. Mm -hmm. And it began uh, in such a way that uh, it was to protect property. And many times when we hear the calls of protesters, for instance, around looting and vandalism that happens whenever protest happens, uh, there, there's a call to remember that property is not as important as people. Kind of like when a tornado happens and they're like, well, one person was saved, so the entire right. town is gone, but it matters. And then once there's like racial injustice, they're like, you should Opposite. not burn a CVS <laughs> just to right. save 40 black people's <laughs> lives. Like there, there's, there's, there's that side. Uh, what, what, or at least maybe that's just pointing at the fact that people would rather have violence and death be accidental than deliberate. Uh, but I think this year is different only because, uh, there was enough accumulated evidence and experience Mm -hmm. and moments of awakening for people to collectively take it, take something very old seriously as if it was new. Mm -hmm. And so the election of Donald Trump catalyzed a lot of liberals, um, particularly white liberals, uh, around understanding that things that had always been said. 
there are many things that are such as there are many things that are racist about American systems and institutions. Um, racism is not dead. Color blindness is not sufficient to keep the peace. Believing in meritocracy is a myth. All of these things that a lot of people of color have said for generations and generations. Now on these folks watch, Donald Trump was elected and we've seen what, what has happened. I know that some people may be listening and being like, what does Donald Trump have to do with racism? I would encourage you to find someone who wants to explain that to you. Mm-hmm. But but for for the rest of us who understand what white supremacy sounds like, looks like, et cetera, between Mike Brown being killed in 2014, causing the uprises in Ferguson, Missouri, to the people sitting around and watching The 13th by Michelle Alexander, to people reading The Warmth of New Suns by Isabel Wilkerson, to Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, being like the number one corporate bestseller on anti on like racial theory. All of that stuff has been happening over the last several years. So George Floyd is not, George Floyd's murder was not in any way unique. It was mm-hmm. situationally important because of the things that were growing mm. uh, prior to, I believe, the things that were growing prior to his murder. And secondarily, as it relates to that police officer killing him, that was a specifically and uniquely grotesque and violent murder. Mm-hmm. You're talking about a, a, a an eight minute 46, I believe, second video uh, of a man crying out for help. And the nonchalant nature, which I think a lot of people don't realize that police abuse doesn't always happen when just when police are yelling. It happens sometimes when they're smiling or sometimes Mm -hmm. when they just don't care and they look like it. And that's what people saw. And then finally, I think it was the fact that he called for his mother. Um, Mm -hmm. The problem of violence is that for violence to provoke empathy, violence has to be accessible, meaning that people have to be able to relate to your pain in order to value it in many ways. That's a that's, I think, a a problem in like perhaps the human genetic code. Like we require violence to be a teacher. And the moment that there's not violence, we assume that there is a permanence in safety. Mm -hmm. So we're not proactive. Uh, We insist on this reactivity that opens up the space for more violence because we lose our vigilance. Like with George Floyd being in May, uh, now it's uh, October and people are like, so is this stuff still matters? Is this like still an issue? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like like their guard is now because they think that because because they don't see something that everything is fixed. Mm -hmm. And, And so George Floyd's, that instance of violence was so unique and so violent and so accessible because what he was asking for was something that I think almost anyone would ask for. It was a what I would call in my practice, it was an epiphany moment that forced people to go to stage two of growth along in, in their empathy. Uh, stage two being they, they went to the mirror. Uh, they mm-hmm. saw something in the world that was incongruous with what they thought was fair or right or just. And then that forced them to go to the mirror to see what they had, what, what that had to do with them. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think this is a fairly uninspiring observation, but I don't think we can discount the fact that there were 30 million people without a job in that moment. There was a lot of people stuck at home in that moment. There were a lot Mm -hmm. of people spending an extra two hours a day online. And so there was this space in culture for like, I'm not at work. I'm not thinking about something else. I'm not watching the new TV show because nothing new is happening. But this is something that I can do something about. I can take power back and and try to exert some some action in the world. So it felt to me like it was, yeah, like it was the culmination of everything you described. And there was this space for to be filled. Yeah, there was there was right before that, right? There was there was the uh, the Central Park jogger situation. Yep. There was the rise of the word Karen, right? The term <laughs> Karen, and and eventually the backlash from white women about the the term. Th- that that was all swirling. I was on a lot of panels prior to George Floyd's murder about the racialization of COVID deaths and the mm-hmm. ra- racialization of survivability metrics. That mm-hmm. specifically in a place like Chicago of the first. Uh, 80 people, uh, sorry, the first 100 people who died of COVID-19 in my city of Chicago, Illinois, uh, I believe it was 79 or 80 of them were Black. And and today, Black and Latinx people uh, have the lowest chance of survival and the highest probability of contracting COVID. And people don't want to dig into why there are racialized outcomes. And I think partly the reason for that is they don't want to dig into it because they don't want to think about the fact that race could even be at play in a medical situation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But all that was swirling, all that was swirling. And then we had a 
almost nine minute video of America dying uh, and calling out for its mother. Xavier, one question that brings up, I've been in a lot of very heated conversations with white people in the last six months. And the thing that I have struggled with, so I'm going to ask your opinion on this, is why is it so difficult for us to admit that we are participating in a rigged system? Uh, I I can answer that as a black man, but why it's been so hard for me to admit that I participate in rigged systems. I think every person probably has their own nuanced reason. But for me, so for example, uh, as a, as a cisgender heterosexual man, Mm -hmm. uh, a male, like it's, it's one of the hardest growth moments in my life was acknowledging the privileges I experienced as a, as a cisgender heterosexual man, meaning that I have privileges over people who are not heterosexual. I have privilege over people who are not cisgender. Uh, and I have privileges over people that don't identify as male. Mm-hmm. Like, like for me and in the space of like, mm-hmm. yeah, but I'm black. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like there's, and that's, that's, that's the issue, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's the issue. Like there's that thing. Black, for instance, like it, it's been long talked about in my sector, black heterosexual men and white heterosexual women have more to do with oppression together than they think. Mm. And it's because we have this singular degree of marginality. And oftentimes, mm. as, as you know, in the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, it says, you know, when the slave was given power, it became a tyrant. And it's this notion of, uh, do you know how to transform your experience into liberation rather than translate your experience into becoming the master? Mm. Uh, those are fundamentally different things. The work of liberation requires a redeeming of the spirit but also a redeeming and a revolutionizing of the system that the human operates in. And that's often what society says we can't do. Mm -hmm. That's also where I find people like myself, as I engaged and and was at once very defensive about my privileges, I didn't want to do the work of personal transformation that was required. I mean, I could see what was coming. Mm -hmm. I could see like, oh man, I got to think about like, my dad. And I have to think about what I think about what he taught me about being a man. I have to think Mm -hmm. about like my, my church and like what Mm -hmm. that means for me. I need to like take a critical lens to like what I want in life and how I have conversations. Like, can I speak up now uh, in conversations? Do I need to like check my privilege every time I'm talking? Like I I went through all of that. Like Mm -hmm. I get it. The challenge is finding the harmonious space of realizing that relationship, which is what diversity, equity, inclusion is about, societally beneficial and equitable relationships requires that you take a realistic look, not only at who you are, but at the effect of who you are when you and your identity kin are together. Mm -hmm. White people don't want to see themselves as a people. Mm. Hard stop. They don't want to see themselves as a people. They break, if you, if you ever label them as a people, they'll say, no, I'm Irish. Or no, I'm mm. Italian. Or no, I'm I'm Dutch. If you ever want to call them out as a people in America, they'll say, No, I'm an American. That's a national you know, origin. That's not a people. Like, sure. like they don't they don't understand that the nature of white supremacy is to always group everyone else as different. Mm-hmm. And then white people as undefinable. Mm-hmm. When everybody else who is having to assimilate into white culture, which I know a lot of white people would say America is not white culture, it's diverse. No, we are enduring this thing. We're putting on, we're, Africans are taking off daishikis, putting on suits. Mm-hmm. People from Japan are, are changing their names so that they can be short and so-called simple enough for the, I would say, dialectically and linguistically lazy Americans to be able to pronounce them. People from other countries are hiding their entire cultures and their, 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 the things that they love about their lives at the door just so they can get a promotion at work so that they don't seem like they yeah. like, don't fit the culture. Like it, is a, it is a wholesale lack of ability and, and an American tradition to not hold the tension of our differences, but rather, uh, I think, the American tradition, which is inherently neo-colonial. And I say colonial because... It is the role of a colonizing practice to 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 demand assimilation, which mm-hmm. is to say, mm-hmm. you don't, you're not you, you're me with different skin. You're not you, you're us over here. If you want to get ahead, mm-hmm. it's not my job to adapt to a greater level of diversity. It's your job to homogenize yourself, standardize yourself, 
because you value what I can produce for you because that might just be your wages. Like that's the thing. And I think that's hard for white folks to reconcile that singularly white people, and I say this singularly, white culture, white people in America created and sustained that system in America, though it exists in many ways around the world. In Mm -hmm. America, it was white people and it still is. Mm -hmm. So that to me seems like a really good jumping off point then to talk about work, right? Because you're Mm -hmm. really, you're talking about the the system forcing assimilation and not recognizing the the difference in the diversity. So so since the show is Brave New Work and not Brave New World, although maybe we should do the spinoff, let's talk about work. Like how how do you see the broader cultural narrative of what you're talking about showing up at work? What is different about it? What's the same about it? Is it a microcosm of the bigger thing? Are there things about the work environment that are different and unique and bespoke? Just talk a little bit about that so we can kind of set the table and then we can dig deeper into how to take action at work. Yeah, I think I think the office space, well, I shouldn't say office space, given everybody's working at home for the most part. And the <laughs> um, Zoom space. Yeah. Oh, geez, I can't stand Zoom. I can't. I just, I just, uh, the, the, the nature of work is really changing quickly right now. As it relates to like diversity, equity, inclusion work, I think you 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 call it Jedi justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. And I just want to say for anybody's listening, like people get hung up on the words. They're like, "Well, we say EDI. Well, we say J E D I. Well, we say D E I. We believe diversity is important. Well, we say I and D. Uh, it's like, all right, look, we. we... <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Like as a, as a DEI practitioner, I hear it from every angle, every different way. And I'm standing in the middle, like, look, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how you, where you put the letters, it's how you define them and prioritize them. Mm. Yep. So if you think that diversity is important then me, so for instance, like the Breonna Taylor case, the Breonna Taylor case is a perfect example of work, the, 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 the uselessness <laughs> of diversity and inclusion, a perfect case for it. If Mm. you look at from a workplace perspective, from a, we need to bring more people of color in, we need to advance more women into leadership. We need to X, Y, Z, we need to, it's all about diversity, right? Changing the, the, the faces of the people. You have the case of Breonna Taylor, a woman who was shot to death in her own home. Right. When a police uh, uh, broke down the door, came in and, and shot her to death. And on one side, you've got the moral arc of the universe, which is a civil case. And so a city on behalf of its police saying this was wrong. It shouldn't have happened. Here's 12 million dollars. And then you have mm-hmm. the law itself, like the workplace policy, mm-hmm. like the actual law itself saying there's nothing wrong here. Keep it moving. <laughs> Right. Right. Like, like that's the one from one side, every organization should be looking at that as a microcosm of itself. Right. Mm. What, what policies and practices do we have in place where mercy or justice would be illegal? Mm. Right. Right. On the other side, we have this conversation around, well, what do we want? We want to be inclusive. We want to be diverse. We want to be equitable. So if it, if the law doesn't account for it, do we have any practices or policies or space? To actually tell a person or a people who were harmed, hey, this mattered and we need to resolve this. Like we have to have restitution for this, right? That's that's the challenge of this entire side of the work. There is a morality and an, and an integrity and ethics conversation that has its own currency and outputs. And then there is a pragmatic legalistic side of it, right? H, the human resources department conversation sure, or the general sure. counsel at a firm, their side of it. You had a black man who was the executive, highest in his chain, the, in, in, in the chain of command, uh, go up and being flanked by nothing but women in the background as they were the highest in their ranks. And all of them are standing here together to say, no justice. Mm. <laughs> right? Like, mm-hmm. like there's diversity, right? They're there. They're present. There's inclusion. Right. They're they have room. power, right? They're allowed. They're, they're speaking and they have authority to act, but the mm-hmm. system doesn't allow for equity. Mm. it doesn't allow for it. it. In fact, equity would be illegal. Like this is, this is why I'm always pushing companies to say, hey, look, you can't use these terms interchangeably. I don't care which one comes in front of the other on paper. Sure. I sure. care about how you define them and how you prioritize them. If you think diversity is important as a DEI practitioner and justice informed, all that company is going to ask us to do is how do we make our workplace more diverse? Yeah, it's all and then I'm a, 
yeah, I'm going to be bringing black and brown folks, women folks, people with disabilities into your workplace to get microaggressed <laughs> and harmed. Right. Like, and it's then like, leave. yeah, you know what I mean? It's the guy who's like, how do I, I, you know, I keep losing my girlfriend. How do I get a new girlfriend? It's like, <laughs> dude, maybe it's you. Maybe it's <laughs> right. you. Like, stop looking for new options and start going to the therapist. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like it's you. It's not about <laughs> include it's not about more coming. It's not about the the inputs. It's about what you're putting out. And eventually you get a reputation. And that's what happens to a lot of companies. They get a reputation and their only thing is like hammer nail, bring more people in. And it's like, no, <laughs> stop. <laughs> stop. Stop. Yeah, actually one of the questions that I wanted to ask you was really about in organizations thinking about that top of funnel in terms of candidates versus retention over time. Because yeah. having been in and around the HR space in my career, that I've heard the exact same drumbeat of like, we just need to be on different college campuses. We just need to be like in different groups of people. Our networks are just too homogenous, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, right, but like uh, more diverse candidates means more people who are completely fucking miserable once they work here. So yeah. how do you like when you're when you're having these conversations inside of companies, how do you help them think about making a place that feels like a diverse population could belong and thrive? Well, that's a complex question. We have another hour. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a not even we don't even have three words like, or less. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna split it apart, and if I go too deep on one side of it, just reel me back in. So, so one, you a, a company has to know what how it defines dissatisfaction with the workplace. Like, mm. how do you actually receive information, and how do you value information that accurately measures dissatisfaction? With the workplace, and then how do you assign uh, credibility to the people who are registering dissatisfaction? Like they're actually announcing it. So one side of it is the question around how do you could, how do we as an organization uh, listen? Right. Some people will have a, a you know grievance policies or whistleblower policies and these things for more egregious actions. But the reality is, like like a lot of and this is like the conversation around why the conversation around racism is so hard. A lot of the injustice moves in the realm of intimidation mm. and trauma. It doesn't move in the realm of visceral, kinetic, highly and hyper visible actions. Mm -hmm. It's not like somebody's like dropping the N word and then saying, bring me that spreadsheet N word, <laughs> Williams. Like, it's like, not so like that's not egregious. No, yeah. like, you know what I mean? It's not like somebody's like calling women at you, like, hey, B word, get over here and bring that pretty butt up. Like, that. That's not, that's not, that's not even what you should be looking for at this point, though you mm -hmm. should be looking for that. The reality is, is a lot of it moves through intimidation. It moves through looks, it moves through glances, it moves through pronouns, not nouns, right? So it's when you use group identifiers like they, mm. uh, or, 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 or them, or we, or us, and someone is new in the space and they don't identify with that us or them group. Right. Uh, and, and then they immediately register, oh, this isn't for me. This is mm. for them. This space isn't for that opportunity isn't for us. Right. It's for them. That's how this stuff moves. And that's like the vast majority of it. And so this is why I go back to, you know, my first response was first, you have to really be tactical and forensic about how you understand listening for the t the way in which this level of dissatisfaction or this level of violence in some cases is being experienced. And most folks, you can't, you can't capture that with like uh, employee engagement surveys that say, do you feel like you belong? Mm -hmm. That's, that's not going to get it. You got to get more nuance in those questions. I will say this is something that's been, it is very challenging for me. So I fight a lot with lawyers and it's for the same reason that uh, the Breonna Taylor case is what it is. Right, because right. the lawyers are the keeper of the law and the law does not have space for DEI. Mm. You actually have to fight the law in order to get equity if you don't have equity right. now. Not only that, the only way the law will acknowledge that equity doesn't exist is if there's a precedent of somewhere else, some other keeper of the law saying it doesn't exist here. So you have to move through precedent. Like This is why justice takes so long. This is why workplaces take so long to change. They're always looking retroactively 
rather than futuristically. And they don't assign credibility to the people who have not been there. So if you have your first African-American employee, or you have your first woman employee, or you have your first transgender employee, or you have your first indigenous person in your company, and that, that's not a that's not a, a, a hyperbole. Like there are a lot of companies and nonprofits and foundations that For sure. they hired one black person. They have their first black person ever. Yeah. <laughs> like, you you actually don't. There's a high likelihood that you don't know how to understand what they would even not want, mm-hmm. or right. how they would register dissatisfaction. So the the question around retention, bringing people in, being secondary to creating a nest ready for eggs, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, there's, the first thing you have to do is you have to think around, to keep this uh, metaphor going, you would have to think about what is the shape that the eggs need for mm-hmm. them to be, to be safe. Not mm-hmm. what do I, how many sticks can I gather to make a nest? You have to think, what is the shape of this thing? What is the nature of this thing? And in order to do that, you have to go through the work beforehand to understand what you're asking to be brought in. This is why you hear many, many people like women say, hey, guys, stop mansplaining to me what my experience is. Go read a book, like Mm -hmm. pick up Brene Brown, then come talk to me. Like, (laughs) I'm not here for this. Uh, You hear a lot of black people say, my pain is not your classroom. It's not my job to teach white America about the effect of it or even the existence Mm -hmm. of it. It's Mm -hmm. not my job. Uh, And I think that's all true. I I think it's absolutely true. It is traumatic. It is very traumatic to have to constantly draw up your pain for someone else's learning. Mm -hmm. And I say that as someone who voluntarily does it for a living. I've chosen to do that. Uh, But I wholly recognize how painful it is, the amount of mental healing and therapy that I have to continually go through. Mm just to be in a space with people who are learning that I exist as I do. As I am not there for myself, I am there for other people who are like, I ain't doing that crap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, like while holding people who are like, well, prove to me this is a thing. Mm-hmm. Like, like, mm-hmm. What's the value? What's the, what's the, how can we make more money if we're diverse? What's uh-huh. the business case for treating these folks well? Sure. Like, like, like that requires a level of emotional dexterity and strength and psychological readiness and intellectual capacity and linguistic excellence that I did not know I was signing up for that has taken me over a decade to grow. And I don't think that any company or person should assume that someone who did not sign up for this should be the person doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's also why we have such resistance around the real work around changing culture. It's because the mostly white folks who lead these companies, particularly large scale companies like the Fortune 500 or 1000, they don't even know how much it costs to invest in this type of change transformation. You know, I, right. I've, seen, I've seen companies with 80,000 employees have one person in charge of everything we just talked about. Mm. <laughs> one person. <laughs> just insanity. Perfect. Yeah. And they usually start with hiring a person of color. They're like, this is where we're going to start doing the work right. All right, now. Clean up 40 years of not doing the work. <laughs> like, well, let us know like, when it's done. Yeah. And it's like they, they give her, because it's usually a black woman, they give her like a $2,500 annual budget and say, find somebody who can come in and talk real good about this stuff and maybe make us think about it a little bit. And that's the work for them. Uh, it's, it's, it's very challenging. One thing I think, and you all didn't ask for this, but I could sort of give the framework for how I think about the change and transformation in companies. There's a, there's a pedagogy we use in Justice Informed called the spectrum of, of diversity, equity, inclusion, that we, we encourage all any type of institution to consider what their work looks like through this spectrum, uh, self-identifying where they're at, and then seeing the work forward. So when, when you think a lot of, a lot of people right now are a lot of companies and nonprofits and philanthropic foundations, a lot of institutions in general are just starting their work at institutionalizing the, the work of creating equitable relationships, Mm -hmm. which is, that's what DEI is. It is about institutionalizing the way that relationships should be and creating a higher probability that the relationships you currently have and will have in the future as more people come into your institution, that that experience will be not only positive, but it will be equitable. And so the beginning of it is really where I feel like 90% of the folks stop. (laughs) Um, They stop at the starting line. And the starting line is growing your understanding. Mm -hmm. 
A lot of people are like, I just, I don't understand this. Uh, the right. first thing you've got to realize is that our schools do not teach what I do. Uh, sure. One of the challenges I have with hiring, as we right now have several open positions, one of the challenges I have in hiring is that this is not a formal practice in right. hardly any institution. It does not have 200 years of investigation and practice and process. There is no scientific uh, approach to DEI. Mm-hmm. There, you know, we're at a point in time now where people like me who are black, who grew up dirt poor in the land of opportunity, who has already buried many of his parents and uncles and aunts uh, for reasons that are racially specific that I would have to fight just Mm -hmm. to get other people to acknowledge that part of the reason why I did lose my father and I have lost my cousins and all of my uncles are dead is because they had a black experience in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some people are just waking up to that. And so for an organization, Before you talk about bringing in more people like me, again, you have to take care of your nest. So you have to grow an understanding of who people are, what they need, what experiences have they had, what challenges do they have, what are the definitions for things. Uh, I can't engage a conversation with a CEO about how to truly transform their company if they don't know what the word heteronormativity means. Mm. Right. I can't. I can't. Uh, It's it's like being a, a, a CPA in the accounting field and trying to engage a CEO about their balance sheet, and that CEO doesn't know what a balance sheet is. Right. right. Like, <laughs> like yeah. I don't know where to start. Yeah. Like, Good luck. Okay, like, uh, now imagine there's no accounting 101 class. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you can't just go back. Imagine there's no CPA license. There's no certifications. There's no accreditation. Imagine that world. That's the DEI space right now. That's the space I work in. Mm-hmm. It's It's... Uh, it's still people are still contending with the value proposition, even though the effects of not focusing on it are present. And mm-hmm. so we encourage everyone to start by standardizing the probability that everybody has consensus around why we're doing this and what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And so that's the understanding point on the spectrum. Services that like companies like Justice Inform provide around that are like DEI trainings. Mm-hmm. I create learning series, right? Our team might do a series of employee engagement events where it's like, okay, we're going to have a, a, a day and a half retreat for the whole company. It's going to be focused on a lens of uh, gender diversity, racial diversity, and ability and disabilities, mental and physical. And we'll craft this day and a half retreat for this organization or company. Side by side with that, over the course of 90 days, Xavier is going to be doing key uh, town halls with our CEO. Mm -hmm. Um, about this to keep, to keep the pace, keep pace, keeping, uh, things moving at the same time, our ERGs or BRGs, business resource groups or employee resource groups, whichever way you want to go, they started as ERGs. Uh, but then people were like, but what's the business case for our employee (laughs) resource groups? Let's call them business resource groups because they, they can't be cost centers. We got to make some money on this. Now we can give them money Uh, for pizza. (laughs) Exactly. Like now, now we can have a black history speaker. Let's bring Xavier in. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Like, huh. I've, been, I've uh, been in that conversation for sure. Yeah. Right. Wild. Like a side note, I, I, I just wish the pace of progress didn't move at the mm. pace of the fragility of those who have privileges. Like racial progress in America moves at the pace of white fragility. So well, gender said. progress in America moves at the pace of male fragility. Mm-hmm. LGBTQ progress moves at the pace of heterosexuals fragility. The people in power set the pace and they act as if they have no control it, and they have the power. Yet when confronted with the effect of their power, they seek to have proof of the evidence of the power itself, mm-hmm. which shows they, they don't even know who they are. They don't even know who they are. They are a bull in a China shop called America and George Floyd is dead. Mm -hmm. Um, The the second part of the spectrum is uh, rooting. Rooting work, R-O-O-T-I-N-G, that's where the work is actually happening. That's where like I get excited. Mm -hmm. the, The challenge with rooting work is that you can't do it unless you have some level of consensus in a company or an organization. And I say that because Rooting work is where the fights happen. Mm. The moment you start putting stuff on paper, mm-hmm. people see what's coming. Mm. Mm-hmm. They see what's coming. 
That's where the comment. Wait, 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 wait. You said that we have to be gender diverse. We we need to be gender diverse by 2028. Well, we're just going to be bringing in a bunch of unqualified women. Is that what you're saying, Mark? Like that's that's when you start to get those <laughs> statements. Like, yeah, like yep. a when guy the meets the road. You know what I mean? Which only shows the bias underneath that person. It's like, oh, so you think there aren't qualified women? Did you sure. see the recent qu- presidential debate? Like, do you think we have no better options than this? <laughs> like, did you see the recent debate? Like that, perfor- those are the only two people who can be the boss. Yeah. And in that, in the face of that, you're still going to tell me there aren't more qualified women out here. Yeah. The argument that here. like the bar <laughs> must be lowered to have that aspiration is, uh, it is real. And, and the challenge is when the person saying something like that is the boss. Like mm-hmm. when they're in the C-suite, usually you, the, people invest even more in that person. The company will invest. Right. They'll be like, we're going to get you a $30,000 coach. <laughs> like, like we're going to try to coach. That out uh, of you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully Donovan catches up. And given he's the chief financial <laughs> officer, he's really good at what he does. Uh, so we can't, we can't lose him. But racism is okay, but a lack of profitability is not. Um, so. <laughs> Xavier, I want to I want to pivot to the varsity for a second because we do, we only have a few more minutes and I and what I'm really curious about is let's let's fast forward to we're aggressively on board and we are rooting and we are trying to get serious. What does in a radical future what does equity look like? And I ask because at the ready we have a commitment to diversity that we're that we're acting on and we've changed our whole hiring process around it and that's going well. We have a commitment to inclusion and participation. The way we govern and run the company is very balanced and and we're we're at least aware of power and how we play with it. But then when it comes time to talk about equity, it's like, well, what exactly does that mean, right? Are we going to pay people differently? Are we get, like what what does it mean to balance the the playing field? So I'm curious if you've ever seen or thought about or talked about like what does radical equity look like in, in a company that's ready to play at that level? Uh, I can't create the answer for that. <laughs> and I don't say that as a cop out. I say that no, no. because I believe the future that we need to live in is one that is also co-created. Mm -hmm. I have my ideas. I am also often vetoed. Justice Informed (laughs) is a company that I started because I wanted to have a playground for my ideas. Mm -hmm. I wanted to take on the consequences of my truth and uh, to live them out and to do the deeds that force me to reckon with the ideals I have to see if they're worthy of becoming ideas others should consider. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do with Justice Informed. Uh, I I wrestle with the cost of equity every day. I have team members. I have people I'm responsible for. I also have a budget. Yep. I have uh, a public reputation uh, and people looking at me as if I represent the company. And so when I speak out against police abuses and the need for defunding police, does, how does that reflect back on my company? And is that the, the thinking of my team? Right. Like I'm dealing with all of that stuff, too. Right. But the world we have to live in, that's where I stop. That's where I say it's not about Xavier. It's about us. Now, I do believe that the people who are doing the work right now to model and consider and fight around defining equity and doing the the innovating and the iterating, as they would say in Silicon Valley, the prototyping, uh, (laughs) I think they should have first right of refusal over the definition of the society we live in. Mm hmm. Uh, I've seen some examples that really encourage me. Like I'm really encouraged by companies like Ben and Jerry's. Mm -hmm. I'm really encouraged by companies like Patagonia. There are small companies that really, like y'all probably never heard of that really encourage me as well. I think they're doing it right. I also think that there are spaces where they're like completely, they're just dragging their feet. Mm -hmm. But in the world of people who drag their entire bodies, I'm appreciative of folks who just drag Mm. their feet. (laughs) <laughs> or people who want to be carried <laughs> instead of dragging themselves. Um, let me just answer this directly, Aaron. What I would want is an economic environment and calculus where companies had to take responsibility for the things that society dealt them, respective to the things that the company creates that hurt the world. So for instance, the, the, the reality of the, the, the gender pay equity gap, 
white women making, I believe it's 71 cents for every dollar that a white man makes, black women making, uh, I think it's somewhere like 54, 54 cents. That delta between white women and black women is not, a, is not often analyzed, understood, or, or re, reorganized in a, in a company. Mm-hmm. And if you were to do something like that, the moment you did it, I'm pretty sure everybody who wasn't getting what they would call a pay increase rather than a pay equity correction would be up in arms. Mm. I would want that equity would be a, uh, a world where everyone understood it is not just our job to produce. It is our job to correct. Correct what we did not cover. Correct what we took. It is not our goal as a company to be so profitable that we can be charitable because the goal of life is not to give back. The goal of life should be not to take first Mm -hmm. so that you don't need to give back. We should not, equity is about the the, the non-commodification of of humanity, which is fundamentally opposite to the tenets of hypercapitalism. And so in order for equity to exist, we would have to, to decouple the notion of people from their production while still having a definition for work. And that seems like a fantastic place to draw things to a close and a t-shirt that I would like to wear. Uh, So uh, (laughs) Xavier, where can our listeners find out more about you and your work? Uh, Yeah, my whole life is public. So (laughs) um, you could literally just Google Xavier Ramey Chicago and come up with a bunch of stuff. But the company website is justiceinformed.com. Any of your social impact consulting needs from diversity, equity, inclusion, a corporate social responsibility, equity focused philanthropy or community engagement for all of you nonprofit folks out there. My personal site is XavierRamey.com. I am most rambling on Instagram stories at Professor X, but that's uh, E-C-K-S, not the letter X spelled out. Amazing. If you love hearing us talk to people like Xavier, please do review us. It's how we get people like him to come and talk to us. So please review us. Please uh, share us with a friend, particularly an episode like this that we all need right now. Please pass this wisdom along to someone who could use it. Absolutely. And as always, a quick tip of the hat to Taylor Marvin for making us sound good. Brave New Work is produced by The Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way they work, and hopefully move in this direction. You can get in touch with us by emailing podcast at the And as for you, thanks for listening. Now go change something.